Well, May, thank you so much for joining us here on The Build Podcast. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, Blake. So today we're going to be talking about different things that you can focus on and what to prioritize as a founder and specifically looking at product versus distribution. So Justin Kahn had a great tweet back in 2018, which said that first time founders are obsessed with product, but second time founders are obsessed with distribution. What does this mean to you? So I guess when he said that, I was um, definitely a first-time founder then. Uh, Now I am a second-time founder. Um, I think distribution um, is actually a broad term, Blake. And um, I have realized that we've actually broken down what distribution is into three parts. And um, the the first part of distribution is how people find your product. Uh, The second part of distribution is how they get to value, like mechanically, what are the steps they need to take to use it? Um, And then the third part of distribution is how do users tell other people about your product? How do you get that adjacent user? Um, And that's all distribution, actually. And I think once you've had, and this is what I think Justin was getting to, I don't know him, um, but from what I've read, I think once you've had the experience of building something people want, you've got that muscle, you've got that confidence. The second time around, you're a bit more ambitious and you're thinking, how can I build something people want and how can I get it into their hands that much faster? Um, So Justin is a repeat entrepreneur, so I'm thinking that's what he bet. But um, from reading about him shutting down Atrium, it doesn't seem like he shut it down because of distribution and it was more because of unit economics. But you know, I, I, my guess is he would have thought about distribution before they even wrote code. Um, so yeah, I, I, that definitely rings true. Um, but I would, I would break it down even further. Um, and yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, from first principles with writer, um, we have been thinking about how we get this into people's hands really fast. So if we start with the first part of that, What does it look like to be obsessed with product and why is that maybe a first time founder thing versus a second time founder thing? Obsession is a great word. Um, There's so much there. I think it's like what you think about before you go to bed, what you think about when you get up. Um, And practically at Writer, um, it's meant for us product and go to market together. And I think being obsessed with product the first time around is, does this thing work? Um, And I think the second time around is, does it work? And will I be able to get it into people's hands? And to back up for a sec, because understanding what we do uh, and why I think is important um, for understanding how we think about distribution, Writer is an AI writing assistant built ground up for the needs of businesses. And um, what that means is everything from the data we use to train our models. It's the stuff we write at work. The way we taxonomize what writing even is, it's based on the way modern companies are structured from marketing to sales to product to support. Um, uh, we are security and privacy first, which means unlike other tools, we don't use any customer data to train models. We don't even save it down. So the big insight that drove us is that writing really is that last unsystemized major business process. And our goal at Writer is that when people are looking at a blank page, whether it's to write a help article or a piece of collateral, there's actually a tremendous amount of intelligence behind the cursor in terms of what the company wants you to say, what you and your colleagues have written before will impact your users. And so with that being the vision, we can kind of work backwards to get broad distribution for a product like this. And we thought about those three distrib- those three principles. How will people find us? How will they get value? And then how will they tell others? Given that that is what we want to do, right? A professional writing assistant for work. Um, we were really able to get obsessed with product and go to market together, working backwards. So what I'm hearing is that it's not necessarily a kind of one versus the other. It's not like you have to pick a lane between product and distribution. Really, what it's saying is that first time founders are only focused on product and second time founders are focused on product and distribution and sort of taking it to its full completion because you build the product. But then and like you were saying, you know, uh, as a first time founder, the question is sort of does it work? And then the the second question is, does anybody care? (laughs) Now that it works, does anybody care? Um, And that starts to get into distribution. And then the next question is, okay, people care. They were, they are paying attention. Maybe they signed up, but are they continuing to use it? 
Um, and is it getting the job done that you originally intended and why you built the product in the first place? So it's not like product yeah. doesn't matter. It's just that product's the first step and there's a lot of stuff you have to do afterwards. Yeah, totally, totally. I, I think the important thing is like, where is the focus of the obsession and your capacity grows. And so um, as a second time founder, and so I do think like you're just able to get product built and shipped faster and better. Um, but like, what are you thinking about before you go to bed? What are you thinking about when you wake up? Like for us, it is distribution, it is growth. So yeah, I, I love that quote. <laughs> Yeah, it reminds me of, um, I had a conversation uh, actually on on the Build podcast with uh, Chris Miller, um, who's a VP of growth at HubSpot. Yeah, and I love he Chris. was walking me, yeah, he's great. He was walking me through uh, his definition of adoption. Because I think a lot mm. of folks, it's really easy to say, you know, let's focus on product adoption. We got to get our product adoption up. But he really um, unpacks that and says, well, adoption is not a single thing. Adoption is actually two things. It's acquisition plus activation. And both yeah. of those together create an adopted product. And so that's, yeah. uh, again, kind of parallel to this idea of you have to build the product, but then you have to distribu uh, distribute it, and then folks actually have to use it. So I guess that kind of brings up the idea of, of jobs to be done a little bit to me. What do you think the role of jobs to be done is in this framework of product versus distribution or product plus distribution? Yeah, I love the jobs to be done framework. Like people aren't buying a drill, they really want a hole, right? And they're buying a drill to get yeah. a hole. <laughs> um, and um, especially if you are PLG um, and you want to build an inbound engine that's driven organically and, and by SEO, you got to think about jobs to be done first. Because you if you're not thinking about the problem you're solving um, through like the words and the lens that your users are um, looking for your product or a thing that solves their problem as your product does, then you're just going to get it wrong. So um, I love jobs to be done. So many of these frameworks, like you can just over framework your life. Um, but I do think that um, uh, what's nice about jobs to be done is um, to me, it's like the drill versus hole. Um, that is like the perfect way to analyze it. People aren't buying, don't want an AI writing assistant. They want better writing. Now, it just so happens that in our market, you know, there is this massive player that has spent a lot of money to educate the market on what an AI writing assistant is. So we, you know, that is something that the audience already knows, but um, that's just a quirk of the market we are in. You really have to understand how you, your specific audience, your specific users think about the problem, the words that they use, um, because that is going to feed into all of the acquisition you do. So let, let me pull all this together and test something with you. So yeah. through the lens of, of writer, which obviously is, is uh, intended to improve people's writing in the professional environment, if you were merely focused on product or merely obsessed with product, that could take you down a path of, well, if we want to improve people's writing, where do they write? They write in a word processor. Um, maybe let's build a new word processor. Um, let's build a new Microsoft Word. Let's embed sort of intelligence into it and let's make folks uh, better writers that way. You could reach that conclusion and maybe you could build the best word processor on the, in the world with all this AI embedded into it, but then you go and launch it and nobody wants to adopt a new word processor. So you're, you're sort of then stuck. So you might've been focused on product, built an amazing product and it totally will get the job done, but nobody's using it because nobody wants to switch off of Word or switch off of uh, Google Docs, for example. So looking at it through the lens of jobs to be done and distribution, let's not build a word processor. <laughs> let's build something that wherever you're writing, we bring that intelligence, we bring that AI writing assistance in. And that's sort of um, something that folks will then adopt. It doesn't require the switching costs for something that's a core system that they use. And that is what distribution, being distribution minded can look like while you still are solving the same problem. Yeah, how does that absolutely. how does that land? That's, does that make sense? That, that's perfect. And th th those are actual conversations we had early on in the life of the company. So you absolutely nailed it. And I think that um, you know, in our case, like it's so 
explicit and tangible being everywhere versus being in one place. So, you know, not every early stage company is going to have like that perfect analogy. Um, but yeah, being able to focus on um, being where people are right for us is is distribution. Now, in our business, given that we are an AI writing assistant for professionals, um, there's a part of the distribution thinking that's a, that takes a lot of product and edge time that doesn't really show up in the front end. And that's the stuff around, you know, to distribute in highly secure environments, there's all sorts of things that need to happen in how you integrate with Google um, uh, 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 Workplace now. Um, it's called Microsoft Office Suites, Enterprise Microsoft Environments. Um, and so distribution for your audience is going to mean something different. And at Writer, um, it definitely means like that invisible enterprisey part around being able to get, you know, 10,000 users at United Healthcare and know our web app. Well, like there's there's a distribution um, mechanism for that. Um, and we've had to think about that bottoms up. So let's talk about what it looks like. We're, we're sort of in the abstract theoretical world right now. So let's like bring it down to the ground level. What does it look like to be obsessed with distribution in real life? How does this take shape at Writer, for example? I, I know you mentioned that uh, being obsessed with distribution is making it easy for somebody to find the product, to get value out of the product, and then to tell other people about the product as well. So maybe through that lens, what does this look like day to day at Rider? What are some of the decisions you've had to make? Yeah. Um, and, you know, early on, it was actually pretty tough to find like very practical advice on this. So I'd love to be as detailed as, as possible to help folks who are early stage listening. Um, in my previous company, we had like one or two KPIs per team, and, and that basically worked. In a distribution focused world, it's actually a much longer short list of metrics that should all move together if shit is working. And it's not rocket science, um, but it I do think it's helpful to hear um, you know what we do, and 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 that has been collated from um, um, uh, talking to a lot of other um, successful entrepreneurs on what they did in the early stage. So for us, it is overall traffic, visit to trial, trial to activated, activated to paid by acquisition channel, and then GAUs and churn that way too. And it's much more holistic and much more integrated than in a non-PLG business. Um, so all of our experiments and work is evaluated against that whole funnel. Like if we had 2000 Chrome extension installs, but they didn't become active users, or if we improved visit to trial, but it tanked the Chrome extension install rate, right, which is a, for us key to distribution, then those are failed experiments. Um, and so the whole team is looking at the same set of metrics that should all move together versus like different leaders have got different things they're trying to optimize um, in a vacuum. And, and that sounds very binary too. I mean, most people aren't trying to do it in a vacuum, but like when you're distribution focused, when shit's working, it should all work together. Um, now, if we double traffic and improve the trial conversion rate, like that was a good experiment. Whatever we did, we should be doing more of that. So we've got targets down the whole funnel. And the goal week over week is to move all the numbers together. I think you all did a really great job um, publishing some of the benchmarks um, and for PLG. And so like if you're listening and haven't looked up Blake and Kyle's work on that, you definitely should because it's really excellent. Um, so that's that's really, I think, what being obsessed with distribution means. Like, are you um, are you growing your top of funnel and then are they doing what they need to be doing in the product? And then are they telling people about it? And that's all moving and improving together. Um, you've got those elements of distribution going. So I, I like this way of, of thinking holistically about it. It's not just, um, did we get one particular metric to go up? And, and a lot of folks like to use the word vanity metrics, um, but it's usually um, used to uh, discount what your competitor is doing. And then it's never really <laughs> sort of, you never shine the light on yourself and say, where are the vanity metrics in my business? Yeah. <laughs> um, and they're probably everywhere. Um, but this yeah. idea of not having a single or a couple of vanity metrics, but really having all of the metrics, but all of the metrics that tell you is the job being done? Do folks care about the product? Are they using the product? And so it kind of brings in what I'm hearing from you is that it brings in the funnel metrics. You know, you talked about traffic and then visit to trial, trial to install. So you're thinking about those things. But then you're also, which are, you know, again, funnel metrics are folks progressing through the user journey at the beginning phases. But then you're also looking at engagement metrics thereafter, you know, DAUs, for yeah. example. Are they continuing to use it? 
and is it engaging on that front? So that kind of brings in that holistic lens. Is that the way you think about it? Yeah, absolutely. Good summary. Is there still a role then, I guess, for a bringing back uh, vanity metrics, but the good flavor, um, I do believe there's a lot of value in a North Star metric, um, sort of a, a principal metric that sort of, if you only have one, it's kind of the Pareto principle, it, it guides all of the others. What do you think about that? Is there a role for a North Star metric or does this holistic system sort of replace that? Yeah, I, I don't, I wouldn't say if you could only choose one, because I think that's the same thing as saying there's 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 only you know one um and so we we don't do north star but we do have this concept of first among equals um and that is daus um if we have off the charts daus but like a user base that's not growing that's not inviting that's telling us something about our go to market and our product market fit so daus is definitely first among equals um but it is in the context of a healthy growing business so how does this uh, focus on distribution, perhaps, um, I guess, how you think about distribution, what you prioritize, this holistic view, how does this differ from how you thought about distribution as a first-time founder? Were there things that you emphasized back then that you thought were all important that uh, that, that you might not now? Yeah, um, we were um, we were an outbound um, based business, and um, you know, first off, I definitely want to say that I, like I don't think there is any shame in using sales and product experts to help customers see the vision of what your product can do for them. Um, even Superhuman on boards one on one for a three hundred dollar ACV, right? So I'm not I'm not here talking about using money to scale. Um, a, a team or scale a go to market and using people to tell the customers um, a, a story of what their world could look like. Um, I'm really talking about the early days, um, getting to product market fit without spend and without like the quote unquote value selling. I, I do think that is very important to get to product market fit without that. Um, in, in, the, in a previous life, that wasn't the case. Um, uh, we got there with Outbound. Um, and I think I was just much more focused on like um, the like building ARR brick by brick. And I think now I've really internalized um, just like just it, it's very hard for humans to understand exponential growth in any field, actually, like in our bones, we're not built for exponential anything. Um, so I do think it's a learning process. Um, but now, um, you know, that is that is the goal. And so, um, you know, no one's hung up on any one customer. Um, but we certainly are very hung up on users. And that's the big shift, I think, customer versus user um, from an outbound based business to a PLG business. So does that mean that in an outbound based business previously, you, you might have been more focused on, you know, the SDR team and SDR metrics? And are we getting enough outbound calls in and, and those types of things versus some of these funnel metrics? Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, now it is 100 percent automated top of funnel. Um, we have one salesperson. Um, and again, there's no shame. We will definitely add salespeople, um, but it will um, it'll look a lot different than what it was before. Um, now everyone is in the product from day zero. Um, they've been using the product for months by the time someone in sales is talking to them unless they've expressly put their hand up. Um, so I, I do think just the way people use and adopt products is changing everywhere. Like we're talking Accenture by software like this now. So um, it this is not like an SMB or a VSMB type of motion. It sounds to me like a lot of this lands on, and, and even that last point about um, you know SDRs and, and things like that. There's a role for them, but perhaps it's not just the uh, the the volume at all cost role that we were used to from a prior era. That a lot of this yeah. really points to you know a continued evolution that emphasizes activity or in, emphasizes impact over activity. Because I do yeah. think that it's really easy to uh, put metrics against things that are activities and, you know, take SDRs, for example. Um, are you making enough dials? Um, if not, then dial more. <laughs> Let's get our yeah. dials up. Let's get our connect rate up, like all of that stuff. Like this is a lot yeah. of lingo that people talked about, like almost exclusively when it was a, when we were talking about SaaS distribution a few years back. Yeah. Um, now that's not the first conversation you have when you're talking about top of funnel, because that is just merely an activity. It's an input and maybe it's a, a good input. 
but it's also not necessarily the thing that is the ultimate impact you're looking for, which is people using the product, people getting value out of the product. And like you said, people then telling others about the product as well. So this shift is really a shift towards, so what? <laughs> what is the impact? What did it do at the bottom of the funnel, not just the input at the top of the funnel? Yeah, exactly. Look, I mean, it's still very much alive, right? And you kind of read about all of these fast growth b businesses and then the truth is in your inbox, right? Like how many other CEOs have eight SDR emails that are kind of shitty from a very fast growing, quickly minted fintech unicorn that shall not be named, um, that rhymes with lamp. Um, so like clearly people are doing it um, and it's accelerating their businesses. Um, how long it's sustainable for and whether it helps you build, you know, the hundred billion dollar dream um, that I think, you know, I'm, I'm more skeptical about. So in closing, let's bring this to product market fit. So through mm -hmm. the lens of being obsessed with distribution and a lot of things we've talked about, impact over activity, uh, thinking holistically about metrics versus just a single vanity metric, how does all of this connect to product market fit? And when do you know you have it? W what was it like for yeah. you at, at Ryder? Any thoughts and reflections here? Yeah. Um, to be philosophical for just a second, I think... Um, when you're as privileged as we are and you've got like your basic needs met on every dimension, I don't think there could be a more interesting game to play on this planet than getting to product market fit with a team of people you respect and love. Um, I ran in high school, which is sort of a team sport because of meets and stuff, but um, it's kind of solitary. My brothers played soccer and basketball and like I now feel like what I'd been missing out on um, all those years. So all to say that the journey to product market fit is incredibly hard. Um, but if you can approach it like you're on a battlefield in a video game, um, then I think you can really separate yourself from the game you're playing and you'll get better at the game faster if you do. And, and that was kind of my big realization. Um, so we spent the last 18 months or so getting to product market fit. And, and now our next stage is about growth, which is awesome. I think that's the second most interesting game on the planet you could be playing. Um, and I am very excited about this phase too. But your question was about PMF. And I think um, there's probably three iconic pieces written about this. And I'd be surprised if your pre-PMF audience doesn't have them memorized already. But one is, you know, the classic Ben Horowitz thing um, from the hard thing about hard things. You know, the money is stacking up uh, faster than you know what to do with it, etc. cetera. Um, but the reality is that wasn't really like fine grained enough for most of us, right? Um, it's still not very specific. Um, I think the next iconic thing was Rahul's um, paper. And I, it was pretty academic, so I think I'm good calling it a paper um, the, on, the, on the first round blog. Um, and I think the latest edition, and this is what really helped us, um, was from Lenny. And he's got a product market fit piece, but I think it's pretty general. Um, his like gold piece, I think, is what is good retention. Um, so much of the knowledge from on getting from zero to one is in the minds of the people that were there. And the reality is that a lot of the people we associate with breakout successes um, were the people that were there one to a hundred, not zero to one. Those people are probably too fucking tired to like write or do podcasts, <laughs> but it doesn't matter, right? Like the knowledge is out there and it's in this great piece. Um, Thanks to go-to-market folks who are transparent and generous in sharing these metrics um, on what enabled these companies to go one to a hundred. Um, so I guess you can see I'm showing my hand a little already in terms of like, for us, product market fit was about, is about user and dollar retention. Um, you should definitely be tracking things separately because you don't want like business model or pricing, um, uh, which may or may not be directionally correct to be clouding whether you have product market fit or not. Um, so for us, product market fit looked like something on paper. And, and that was really based on, um, you know, us benchmarking the market, what did best in class look like? Here's what our metrics based on our distribution strategy looked like. Um, and like, how are we doing? Um, and that was the paper piece. And then the like in our bones piece, it felt like customers and users telling us um, about how much they loved using writer going on 
camera to tell us how much they loved using Writer, which is huge. Um, inbound and trial starts based on word of mouth. Um, I was really influenced maybe a year and a half ago. The Asana CMO on some podcast said, um, you know, public company, um, 25% of their um, uh, top of funnel is word of mouth. And I was just like, yes, duh. Um, and so that just felt like really good. Um, the other piece was like just this long tail of micro, micro feature requests. Um, and in SaaS, that's amazing because it means you've become the source of truth for a whole set of processes and customers really want to help you complete that product journey. So, you know, that all, all started happening at once, um, which is awesome. We don't spend any money on marketing, zero. We only have one person in sales. And that was a lot, very intentional. Let's nail it before we scale it. So, um, yeah, and now we're scaling it. So we are hiring for like every job imaginable. Um, uh, the JDs haven't even been written yet. So folks listening who want a great gig, um, hit me up. I'm me at Writer. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, that has been kind of our product uh, market fit journey, um, Blake, and uh, lots of things out there to help um, and lots of dark days too when nothing seems to help. Um, but then you find the light at the end of the tunnel. It's awesome. Well, I think a lot of folks, what I'm hearing from that is a lot of folks oftentimes are looking for the single magical definition of product market fit. Um, give me that one sentence or give me that one magical equation that's super simple and I'll just know it for all time that I've arrived at product market fit. Um, and that is not how it works. <laughs> it is, yeah. uh, there's levels to this, um, as yeah, you're kind levels. of describing with, you know, um, you know, Ben Horowitz's perspective is, is sort of a particular level. It gets more specific, um, with Rahul's perspective, it gets more specific and you add something to it with Lenny's perspective. Um, and you need to think through all of those. It's not like one is right and, and the others are wrong or, or, you know, others that weren't mentioned, um, are, are irrelevant. Um, a lot of these things stack on one another and, and complement. And it sort of brings back to the the consistent theme of this conversation, which is really looking at things from a holistic standpoint, not just did I hit one particular metric that told me that I have product market fit, but everywhere you look in your business, from yeah. the metrics to the micro feature requests to people telling you how much they love their product, your product and everything in between, all of that together in concert tells you you have product market fit. It's almost a sense you get rather than sort of a number that turns green on a page one day magically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, May, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Build Podcast to walk us through your journey as a first-time founder going into a second-time founder and this idea of being obsessed or focused on product versus distribution and bringing things full circle. So thank you so awesome. much. Thanks, Blake. Thanks for having me. 